So financial statement analysis is a, a tool in the hands of an accountant that helps him provide information that is essential for decision making. It is very essential to make uh, decisions about a firm's performance based on the past, the present, and the future. We're able to predict the future performance using a trend. So there's what we call trend analysis. And uh, the analysis we're going to look at. Then this also helps to assess using uh, ratio analysis on the solvency of an organization, the ability to meet their debt obligations. And finally, to also ascertain their survival, how the firm is able to produce excess revenues over expenses. And so the tools that are used in financial statement analysis basically are four. We have the horizontal, the trend analysis, the vertical analysis, and the ratio analysis. So today we're going to look at the ratio analysis. The previous session was about trend analysis uh, and uh, horizontal as well as vertical. Horizontal, we have a base year whose figures divide into the subsequent years. Trend analysis is simply a pattern which gives you an array of the pattern in which they're moving. And uh, vertical analysis is upward or down. You use a sales figure or the asset figure to be your basis. So under horizontal, basically, we compute our, our changes in the items from one, one period to another using a quarter or dollar account. For instance, if you have two years, 2017 and 2016, you get the difference, you negate them. 18 minus 16, we get our uh, 1,500. And we divide this 1,500 divided by our base year. So this means that our percentage change is equal to year one minus year two over, in fact, two minus year one over year one. That is a percentage change. So our new year is year two. Our original year is year one. So you get the difference here, two minus year one, the change is 1,508 divided by the year one, which is 16,701. So this gives you a percentage of 9.5. We could also have a negative trend where year two is smaller than year one. This one shows that there is a decrease in the performance. So 3,141 minus 3,205. The difference is negative 64. We divide it by 3205 times 100. So this gives you a negative. So in negatives, we put them in brackets, showing that there's a decrease. So this is what we call the horizontal analysis. So the trend analysis is simply when we have more than what? two periods, it becomes a trend. So the base year is a young year. So what we're going to do is we divide any year. If you have three years, year one, usually one is at the far end here. So year one, year two, year three, year four. So to find the percentages, we divide each of these ones by the base year. The figure in year one, divided by here, the figure in year one times 100, the figure in year one times 100, the figure in year one times 100. So meaning our best year will be 100% throughout. So in this trend here, we have values of revenues, taxes, and the profits. So we're just going to divide our year one into each of these years. Year two, year three, year four, year five, so on. So when you divide 2362 over 2362, 
is 100%. 41, 17 over 23, 63%. So this gives you a trend. A trend is simply a pattern. So it can give you a pattern of whether the performance is going up and down at some point. So using your st in the statement analysis, you're able to interpret whether the performance of the firm was fluctuating downwards or upwards, or it was going upwards. And you, using ratio analysis, will be able to tell. So a trend is simply a pattern. So you can want to isolate the patterns that you want to uh, really analyze, whether it is the sales, the profits, or the gross profits, or the expenses. You want to see how the trend has been just in the expenses. So using our pictograms, you can use bar charts, histograms, as well as line graphs. Vertical analysis also shows relationships between uh, a specified uh, base value against each of the items. So we have a standard. Uh, S O C I. So we also have T A S O F I. So for the income statement, the statement of the comprehensive income, we just use a turnover. So we divide the revenues or the sales into each of the items. But for the statement of the financial uh, position, we um, divide the total assets into each of these figures. So we're dividing the total assets into each of these figures. So in this case, our base for the income statement has to be identified to be the revenue. So the revenue we divide in each of these items here, as long as it is in the income statement to find the percentages. So this is best done using Excel. Excel is very easy. You just command the formulas and um, the percentages will be done throughout. So also, this is how the outcome will come. So this is all on the basis of what? Revenue. Then we could also make our analysis based on the benchmark that is there. If the cost of sales benchmark is, for instance, 50%, your comment is that with both years we're performing better where cost of sales are concerned. But if the benchmark for the profit is 10%, you could say in 2015, we'll be having or performing below par. But 2016, they managed to um, control the expenses, hence having a better profit. So going to the assignment, there was a debate which has been settled for this market there's a question. Yes, I wanted to ask on the vertical analysis. Yes, please. On that slide for the um, for the notes. On the vertical analysis, the slide for the notes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so on this same one, so you're saying when we're doing when we say the best year, like for 2015. We're going to divide everything there by the revenue for 2015. Yes. Then when we go to the column for 2016, we're not going to use 2015. We we'll use the no, same no. one for 2016. No, each one will have its own. So this one, we we'll divide in each of these ones. The 496, we we'll divide here, divide in here, we we'll divide in here, we we'll divide in here. But this 518, we we'll divide in each of these ones. This one here, no one interferes in the other. It's just within. It's ending the business. So it's the... The horizontal analysis is when you use one denominator. The horizontal, yes, that's why we use one, one base. This one goes in all of them. This one goes in all of them. This one goes in all of them. Okay. That's the horizontal. Right, thank analysis. you. Is that clear? Yes, right. thanks. So clearly, this is what we we use. So in the horizontal analysis here. Uh, as you make your works different, I plead, 
make them as different as you can. Of course, I've only sent about four differentiated copies. 20, this is year two, this is year two and year one. And you find the change here, you subtract 20, 3, 0, 5, 4, 2, 5, minus 2, 0, 9, 2, 5, 8, 9, you get 21, 2, 1, 2, 8, 36. So we can create a column for the change. 2, 1, 2, 8, 36. So you divide this divided by, which, what are we dividing this one by? The 2, 1, 2, 8, 6, what are we dividing by? By this one or this one? Which of the two are we dividing it by? Which one are we dividing by? The one to 2019. Dividing it by 2009. Yes. yes, times 100. So you're going to get 10.17%. So dividing by the base year. So we do the same throughout on all these and we divide by the base year. So you see on, a, we'll comment later on, but you see how the expenses were in negatives for the change, meaning our expenses were uh, increasing so you need to also comment on how management of expenses way. So basically this one has been explained in the uh, previous. So in this question here, when you're dealing with the vertical analysis, we I explained to say for the vertical analysis, there are two statements that we are looking at. If we're dealing with the income statement, it is the income, it's the sales that will divide in all of them. But if we're dividing using the balance sheet, it is the total assets. Now the question is, in our assignment, where were the total assets coming from? So the total assets, so for this one here, we're looking at the revenues, which we're dividing. Okay, this one for the comprehensive statement is okay. But here, identifying the base, the base was supposed to be the total assets and total assets come from these two here. When you add them, I think Mark, was it you who had a concern? Do we use this figure or we use these two? So we use these two because this is what makes the total assets. All right, this is what makes the total assets. So when you add these two, according to this document, we are going to divide our total assets <laughs> uh, going to divide the figures by the total assets here we're dividing by the revenue we go to the um But analysis, we use total assets. So it's a summation of um, these two figures, which was giving you something like 3,000 something something. Okay. So when we go to ratio analysis, we need to understand that a ratio is simply a proportion of one element to another. So ratio analysis has about six basic ratios that you need to know. These ratios measure profitability, liquidity. They also are used to ascertain the debt financing. The debt financing is leverage. The efficiency ratios also look at how the fame is utilizing the resources. So ratio analysis involves calculating and analyzing ratios from one data to another. So ratio analysis is mainly about relationships. So there are five main categories of the ratios that we need to take note of. There's liquidity ratio, which looks at how the firm 
uh, has the ability to meet the short-term complications. Uh, is what we call profitability ratios, which is used to gauge a firm's what? Profitability. We have what we call efficiency ratios, which look at how well we are using our resources to generate what? To generate our sales. Then we also have leverage ratios, which look at uh, the extent to which we are financed by debt and the investment ratios, which are also called shareholders ratios, are looking at the performance of the shares. All right. So we go down to the specific ratios themselves. Under liquidity ratios, we have um, five ratios with their formulas given as follows. So we have the current ratio, which is simply the current assets divided by the current liabilities. Then we also have the quick ratio, which has uh, the current assets. We subtract our inventory. We divide this by the uh, current liabilities. Then when we go to our, um, so in the liquidity ratio, there are mainly two, but there could be three. There's also what we call the cash ratio. So liquidity ratio, we are basically looking at two. There's a current ratio, which is the current assets divided by current liabilities. The quick uh, or asset test ratio, which is simply the current assets. But from the current assets, you remove the most illiquid uh, assets, which are the inventory. We divide this by our liabilities. Then we go to efficiency ratios, which look at how we are using our resources. There's what we call a turnover, inventory turnover. Inventory turnover basically look at how long it takes for us to um, sell our stock. Keeping stock for too long is a cost which incurs storage costs, warehousing, and handling costs. We also have asset turnover, which looks at our firm's ability to convert our assets to contribute to sales. And leverage ratio. We have three, we have debt to equity ratio, we have long-term equity ratio, we have uh, mm -hmm. debt to asset ratio. So these ones are ratios amongst each other. And then finally, we have what we call the liquidity ratios, which look at uh, how our um, firm is performing in terms of profitability. So in this case, we have four, or five ratios. We have what we call the net profit margin, the gross profit margin, the return on equity, the return on capital employed, and the return on assets. So all these fall under uh, profitability ratios. So the gross profit margin is simply given by the gross profit divided by the sales or revenues. The net profit margin, which is also called the operating percent, uh, profit percentage or margin, is simply given by the net profit over the sales. And finally, the return on equity is simply the net profit divided by the average equity. Okay. So we now go to explaining the formulas in depth. Of course, these are. Um, um, ratios have been explained in what use they have. This is very vital, especially in establishing the interpretation of each ratio. So liquidity is mainly about solvency. Explain how we meet our debt obligations. So these ratios are very important and you must know what each of them entails. So like I said, profitability ratios, they measure the profitability based on the sales and investment. Liquidity, they measure our ability to service our loans. Leverage, these ones are also called gearing ratios, which measure the extent to which the firm's obligations are relative or are financed by debt. If a firm is over financed by debt, it is over leveraged. The gearing is high. So it's a danger if a firm is uh, over leveraged. Activity ratios also are very important because they give us a degree to which we use our resources. And market or share order ratios look at how the performance of the shares are. 
So each of these ones, these ones are the categories, uh, gross profit margin, net profit margin, and return on uh, assets, the liquidity, the quick ratio, cash ratio, and the liquidity, the leverage, which have debt to asset, debt to equity, and interest cover ratio. In the activity ratio, we have the data selection period, which looks as the time in which we um, take to pay our debt. And the creditors uh, collection period or days looks at how long they we take to pay our debt. Debtors, how long they take to pay us. Stop days, how long we take to pay off. So with those ratios being mentioned, um, we are now going to look at some of the formulas. So these formulas need to be with you at heart. The gross profit is simply the gross profit itself over sales because sales minus cost of goods sold gives us gross profit times 100. Then we also have what we call the operating profit margin, which is a profit before interest and tax over the sales. So just on the profitability ratios here, if we went to our analysis, the gross profit, we get our gross profit over the sales, which is the total revenue times 100. So for 2019, we had uh, this figure. When we go to our gross profit, let's identify the gross profit in this um, document. What is our gross profit figure for 2019? 9, 16, 7, 9, and for 2020, 9, 5, 8, 7, 24. So this is the gross profit. So this is where the figures are coming from. 9, 16, 7, 90, 9, 58, 7, 24. Over the sales or the total revenue. This is 2092, 2305. So when you go here, our revenue, 2092, 2305. So when you apply by 100, this is what we have. So we have our gross profit margin here as 43. Then here we have our gross profit margin as 41%. So you can see that 2019 was slightly higher performing than uh, 2020. Then, which other profitability ratios do we have? We have the operating profit percentage. So operating profit percentage looks at the operating profit before interest and tax over the sales. So help me identify the profit before interest and tax for 2020 and 2019. 2020, 2019. So we have the figures here, 22902, 331,954. So we're dividing these by the sales themselves. So when you go here, the figures are as follows. 22902, 331,994 over the sales figures, you multiply times 100, and these are the percentages. I'll ask for questions at this point, if there are any. Yes, Chiloba. Um, I wanted to know how do you identify the profit uh, the profit before tax and profit, before tax and what and after tax yes, yes, yes. all right so the profit before tax is succinctly shown here so if you see uh, the statement I think we're looking at unit uh, four just uh, on Monday so after the gross profit comes expenses. After the expenses, when you subtract the expenses from the gross profit, we get our net profit before tax. This one is the net profit before tax. Okay. Uh, before interest, sorry. Then here it is. So these are interests. We have uh, finance income, finance costs, all these. So this is the net profit. Um, So this is a net profit before tax. The tax is here, corporation tax is there, and the profit for the year is there. So we have um, three profits there. 
there's a profit which we call the operating profit that has no what interest it has no tax so this is a pro operating profit before interest and tax and this is a profit just uh, before tax but interest has been removed then this one is a profit before interest and uh before tax are we getting there yes all right so they are mentioned it's operating that's called the operating profit percentage the profit that is operating so this is the figure there then we also have the profit for the year percentage we get the actual profit as it's appearing here the profit for the year percentage so this is 59.39 and 274.414 so divided by the revenue so this is the one two 74, 414, and 59, 39 divided by the same um, total revenue. So we get our profit for the year percentage. So the examiner was very succinct in asking you the actual ratio that they wanted you to do. So they asked you to find the gross profit uh, percentage. They asked you the operating profit percentage, the profit for the year. So these fall under what we call what? Profitability ratios. So there are a number of uh, ratios, but um, uh, the examiner will ask you which ones to collect. Then what are these three ratios called? They're called liquidity ratios. The liquidity ratios give you the picture of the solvency of the firm. There's what we call the current ratio, which is simply given by the current asset divided by what? Current liabilities. Okay, current assets divided by what? The current liabilities, All right? Then we also have um, um, the quick asset ratio. Let's talk about the quick asset ratio. What does it talk about? It is simply the assets without stock asset without stock why do we remove the stock the reason is simple there are times when your, your creditor wants their money and you would want to remove the inventory because some inventory you may not even have customers for them so they say please remove the inventory on your assets so current assets minus what stock divided by our current liabilities so each of these ones have a benchmark. For the current ratio, it is allowable or permissible that you have a benchmark of two to one. For the asset test ratio, one to one, which means that for every asset, you have two assets against one Congolese, one liability. For the quick, you could have one asset against one liability. It's better ideally whenever we have more assets than more liabilities. Are we together? Any questions before I proceed? All right. So, when oh, we get... sorry, how about the cash ratio? Yes, the cash ratio also is simply our cash plus the cash equivalent over current liabilities. So the cash ratio is cash plus cash equivalent over our current liabilities. Just the cash where what? a creditor comes in. The cash ratio, I'm sure you want to ask what it entails and uh, its use, isn't it? I wanted to ask about the cash equivalent. Like, what do you mean? Is it like uh, in form of an asset? I don't know the value of an asset in form of cash. I don't know. So equivalent. When uh, we're discussing, we, we look at um, um, any securities that we have in FM that are very liquid. For instance, uh, treasury bills, uh, checks that have not yet been deposited. OK, um, these ones are the most liquid current assets apart from cash. 
because data can refuse if you want to go and collect money. All right, so okay, maybe our time has not come. So we're only looking at the cash ratio, which most of the creditors are very interested in. So these ones are short-term commitments, which hold cash temporarily. They can convert the cash into um, uh, actual cash amounts. So these cash equivalent are also stated in your uh, statement. You can find them uh, in some statement, cash equivalent. So cash equivalents basically, we're looking at uh, um, things to do with um, liquid assets that can be found in the balance sheet, which are short term. Good examples of cash equivalent, like I said, could be um, what examples do I give of cash equivalent? Treasury bills or treasury notes or a commercial paper. These ones are what we call cash equivalent. So they are more liquid. So in this context here, the balance sheet or the statement, okay. We have been given the cash equivalents here, the, the cash. So these entail that you may not, it may not be cash itself, but it's, it's equivalent to cash. For instance, you have a check which hasn't been deposited, it's still lying, or a treasury bill, it's the most secure uh, form of cash. It is still an equivalent to cash. So this is that. So the cash ratio. So it's given by the cash ratio. You remove all the all else, then you divide this one over the current liabilities. So this is um, the formula: cash plus cash equivalence over current liabilities. So in 2019, uh, what was our cash the cash equivalent? We had uh, 225942. 2.25942 over the current liabilities. Now, what are current liabilities? These are short-term debt obligations that we have. So when we go to our current liabilities, our total current liabilities are here. The totals are given here, 13, 86, 16, 30. So 16, 30, 13, 86. So when you divide there, so you discover that you had more, you have portion of our cash equivalent in 2020, meaning we're holding more cash than in form of other assets. And so the creditor would be more comfortable to say, okay, at least they have more money. Should I have an emergency, I can go and call on them. All right, is that clear? Are we moving together so far? Yes, we yeah. are. All right, I'll ask for questions if there are any. All right. So we also go to what is called the debt collection period. The debt collection period basically looks at uh, the length or duration of time that it takes for us to collect our to to collect our money. It is given by the account receivable over the credit sales, not cash, only credit sales. So. Well, the interesting question then, how do we identify credit sales if we have an income statement? So what would denote uh, sales that are on credit? What did we say? Here I make an assumption that all the sales are necessary footnote are uh, credit sales. Okay. Maybe um, what does what does um, the credit period in days connote? What does it tell us? 
the credence collection period. Why is it important? What is creditors payment period? What is it used for? I mentioned this, what is the essence of the creditors? Uh, can I try? Hello? Yes, I'm listening. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm thinking it uh, shows how, how quick we pay our debts. Okay, great. Then why is it important? Why is it important? Anyone? So it gives you a picture of how uh, long we take to pay our debt. It is multiplied by 365 to give us a picture of our duration. So if we take so long to pay, it becomes <laughs> a problem. So here, our collection period, in 2019 was longer than in 2020. So this implies that the debt department was doing very well, but our taking time to pay was really pathetic. We're taking almost over a year to pay our debt, 120 days, and here it increased, all right? It would have made more sense if our payment period was even better here because we received more money here. So this is part of an activity ratio, which gives us how we are managing our resources. Then what does the holding period days tell us? It talks about how long it takes for us to uh, sell our stock. So it's inventory over daily cost of sales. So we divide our inventory, which is a stock, times our cost of sales, times 365. So in 2019, it took 151 days. In 2020, it took 115 days. So this gives us a picture that we are improving in terms of what? Uh, selling quicker. All right. Then we are also asked to calculate the total liabilities to total equity ratio. Total liabilities to total equity ratio. So our liabilities have two components. They are what we call short term and long term. So the issue is also on identifying where are we going to find our liabilities. So the liabilities, here we have our non-current liabilities, which is 610. And we also have our current liabilities, which is what? 1630. 610 and 1630. Okay. So 1630 and 610 of long-term and short-term liabilities. Then the total equity, we look for it in the table here. What is our total equity? Total equity is found in the balance sheet, which is our share capital, which also includes our retained earnings. So our retained earnings, total equity is here. So 991, 10.39, 9.91, here and 1031. So this represents the ratio. So all these have their formula, the total liabilities, the total assets, then the total return on assets, then the return on equity, all the formulas are there. So basically this is um, initial figures. So now, all 
All right. So after finding the ratios, you need to now give an analysis of the performance. So performance will need to be done uh, base by base type of ratio time by type of ratio. So we know there are five types of ratio. So we can start first with the profitability ratio. Now, I have done five uh, differently explained reports. That's why I needed to really have, um, maybe I made them so that you pick what you can, so that you, you made them. So for the particular groups that are already existing, I might send you another copy so that you get, because this is where most of the marks are coming from. So the profitability ratios here, showing the following between 2019 and 2020 have a movement from 2019 to 43 to 2020 which is 41 of course usually above 28 is good but there was a decrease in the profitability ratio there's a decrease there so this decrease could be evidenced by what we can check it out to say there was uh, our Net profit margin, net profit margin, whenever there's a decrease, then just know that there was a misappropriation or misuse of uh, our operating expenses. So from there, we're able to see that the uh, ratio of the profit for the total revenue decreased from 13.11% to 0 0.25 in 2020. Another name for the ratio of the profit is for the year revenue. So the ratio for the annual profit to its entire revenue is another ratio that needed to be considered. So here our profitability ratios under GPM. This is for the gross profit margin. From 2019 to 2020 shows a decline. So you could now want to do a post-mortem of what caused the decline. So profitability ratio basically concerns the trading account. So here, the profits, we had um, 13.46 and here 11.75. Um, of course, our gross profit was higher in 2020 than in 2019. But because the gross profit is simply the sales divided by the gross profit. So what attributed to the loss or less um, of the gross profit margins because there was no uh, infantic marketing front for the 20. Um, in fact, the sales increased here, but the proportion of the sales in 2020 generally decrease in the gross profit margin. So of course, both of them were above the benchmark, which is about 28%. And if we go to our net profit or operating profit margin, we calculated here, our operating profit margin was very drastically low from 15% to 0 0.9. So we're going to look at this here we will discover that our expenses increased almost times five here. So when all these are topped up, our expenses were more in 2020, uh, basically because of the loan that was being paid. You can see there was a loan, natural charge of a loan there. So this caused our operating profits to decline drastically from 33, 33.195 to 22,000. So this was attributed by our huge expenses that were mainly incurred on repayment of the loan. Okay, are we moving together? <clears throat> 